if if he's not here, one of them can feel that either the mic or myself, I don't mind either way. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so good afternoon, ladies and gents. Thank you for joining us. We're here for what will absolutely be a wonderful talk. If, if he's not here, one of them can feel that either the mic or myself, I don't mind either way. Yeah, okay. Brings <clears throat> me to mute YouTube, sorry. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. We're here for what promises to be uh, absolutely wonderful talk by Nick Shaw, uh, looking at the exciting uh, new opportunity for geothermal energy in Yorkshire. Um, we'll start off, I'm Rick Savile from the Yorkshire Geological Society. We'll go through the exciting housekeeping bits um, just before we then pass across to Nick Riley to do his introduction to Nick and then on to the thing that we all came to see, which is Nick's presentation. So if you if you can't hear any sound coming out of a computer, you can probably see my mouth moving. Um, just first of all, check that your speakers are working and connected and that the volume up, don't do my usual trick of muting your computer and then wondering why you don't have any sound coming out of it. If you can't see the, the slides, but you can hear me, that's probably a different problem entirely. And usually the, the best thing to do is to turn Zoom off, log back in and start again. And that usually fixes nine out of 10 problems to be quite frank. If you're used to Zoom meetings, obviously this is a Zoom webinar, it's a little bit different. Uh, participants won't be able to see who else is attending and they're, they're muted. There are some controls on the bottom of your screen. There's uh, a Q&A facility. So if you think of any questions throughout the webinar, if you pop them in there, they'll come through to the panel uh, and then at the end of the session, we'll be doing, um, we'll be basically inviting you to ask the question or one of us will read it out for you. There's also a chat facility in there. If you want to send us a message at any point about anything, or if you have any problem like that, um, or there's, there's a raise hand facility too, and we can then get in touch with you. Um, if you're using Zoom on a desktop, all those controls will be, should be on the bottom of your screen. If you're using them on a mobile device or a tablet, they usually work as a drop down, I think, in the top right corner. Uh, again, if you do have any problems, feel free to send us a message via the chat facility. Um, and if it's a persistent problem, we can sort of provide limited support from this end. I just suggest closing Zoom down, quitting the application, and then starting again and rejoining. If you have any dramatic problems for whatever reason with Zoom, like with all of our webinars, we are streaming this live, live on YouTube at the same time too. So feel free to head across to the Yorkshire Geological Society YouTube channel. And if you haven't already, why not click subscribe while you're there? So I will now pass across to, to Nick Riley to do his introduction. Uh, it gives me- Over um... to you, Nick. Yeah, hi. It gives me uh, great pleasure to introduce to you all uh, Nick, who has a long career in Shell. He's worked in conventional hydrocarbons, unconventional hydrocarbons over many parts of the world and as well as in Europe. He's um, worked in geothermal as well, both deep and shallow geothermal. And he is also a visiting lecturer at Leeds University. He graduated from Leeds and uh, he lives in a, a curious place I've never heard of before, Reynard Clough, above on the moors, I presume. Very French and foxy, it sounds to me, Nick. Anyway, what he's going to address is the role, an important role geology has in the energy transition, and he's going to make it very local and relevant to us, but he has a vast experience from many parts of the world. So without further ado, I'll pass over to Nick Shaw. So I uh, hope I've unmuted myself. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming along. What I'm going to try and do now is to introduce what do I mean by geothermal? Does it need a volcano? And then have a look at some of the foundations and then work through a variety of technologies from ground source heat pump through looking at mines and then uh, uh, 
possibly reusing old wells and then try and put a few of those things together and then see how the YGS can contribute. So the first thing is, what is uh, geothermal? Well, the BGS have, have made some fantastic uh, graphical material, which shows the range of areas where you can extract heat from, from the earth, whether it's recycling sunshine, essentially, or related to mine water, where there's a mixture of uh, conducted heat from the earth, as well as chemical energy due to the oxidation of pyrite in the mine water, or into deeper hot sedimentary aquifers or into uh, ex igneous basement. One of the things I like about geothermal is the smart way you can use the hot water in a cascaded sense. And the Lindell diagram is very nice for uh, looking at the fact that it's not only uh, making steam and then electricity, but you can use it for a whole range of industrial processes, as well as nice spas, uh, drying garlic and, and doing a variety of, of lower temperature activities, including keeping, say, uh, uh, airports clear of ice just by circulating warm water under the, uh, under the airport. So it's a great uh, multiple use. The heat travels by hot water. Uh, and so I just want to go to the next slide, please. So this is a bit of a compilation of a, a few things. First of all, you don't necessarily need to have this nice view of Iceland up in the Heldersee uh, resource. Uh, where you've got a 300 watt megawatt power station, although it would be nice. Uh, what you need is a change in temperature and a large volume. Now, in order to get, say, 25 megawatts of, of power, what you need is something like nearly 500 cubic meters an hour. And if that converts into a volume, that is about 20, 20 big coal trucks an hour or 30 gallons a second, 30 gallons a second. So geothermal is about shifting the heat with lots and lots of big wells. The energy density of hot water is not as great as in the uh, uh, hydrocarbons. So you have to move lots and lots of water. The other key thing about geothermal is it's all about uh, using it close to the market. And I particularly like this Lego model that my friend uh, Walter van Leeuwen uh, made, uh, where you can see this nice hot well producing from a confined sedimentary aquifer under this small little Lego village here. It goes through a, a heat central with a heat exchanger and it gets re-injected. In some situations, you may be able to reuse a cavity and that might be an abandoned mine or something else to either store or produce heat. So what's the foundation we're gonna build this resource on? Well, I think a very good one is, is on the basis of, of, of uh, the William Smith map. Oops, sorry. This is a fantastic map, which I took a photograph a couple of years ago when it was in Scarborough Art Gallery. So it's the, the early William Smith map. And this was the result of a compilation of his, his work in, in Yorkshire and the, the rest of England indeed. Uh, but it also hasn't really changed a great deal. And the, the, the key elements are, are here in terms of the coal field, the, the, the Permian and the Triassic Rim uh, overlying this, uh, uh, the Cretaceous uh, uh, sequence. There's no shortage of data. Uh, in fact, probably it's very easy to get uh, tremendous indigestion from, from trying to look at too much data, but there's a whole range of public, uh, publicly available data. There's 3D data sets, there's these uh, magenta well data, there's mine, uh, mine seismic, there's little clusters of detailed data here, and this goes also into, into the offshore. The, uh, the UK Onshore Geophysical Library is a very nice uh, accessible uh, source. 
Uh, it's got a sort of online GIST system, so you can turn on all sorts of things here. But you can see the main elements here. What we're going to talk about is the coal field, which is outlined here, the overlying uh, Zechstein and, and Triassic, a little bit about the Jurassic, and then on top, there's the unconfined uh, chalk aquifers. So where's the heat going to come from that might uh, be remaining to actually charge up the aquifers and, and, and be uh, the source of a geothermal system? Well, there's a few nice publications uh, that have come recently. There was a compilation of, of the uh, uh, North Yorkshire uh, exploration data. This, this tells us about underlying granites. I guess everyone knows about the Cheviot and the Alston granite, but there's also granites in Wensleydale, and there's believed to be granitic material under the so-called Market Wheaton axis, and then possibly in the further offshore. These are from the Caledonian period, you know, in the late uh, Silurian, early uh, Devonian. They intrude the northern rim of the Arcadia province, basically as, as Pangaea was sort of uh, being, uh, developed. On top of that, during the Variska Neurogeny and after the, towards the end of the Variska Neurogeny, you have this huge intrusion in a very tough uh, state of stress. The, the wind sill actually jacked up and, and squeezed in and put a huge amount of dolerite in. And then the next, uh, the next period of, of uh, geothermal activity was associated with the the breakup of the North Atlantic, when basically Sky uh, was was almost part of Greenland, uh, and 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 this this the the tip line of this the the end of this uh, resulted in the Cleveland Dyke about fifty eight million years ago. So there was heat. Since then, there was a little bit of heat uh, at, at the at the base Paleocene, and then after that. Uh, you, you have uh, rel relatively little uh, thermal activity, uh, but you do have quite a lot of uh, uh, structural data. The YGS uh, publications have had some fantastic compilations, which give you a very nice view as, as to where I live, which is just very close to, uh, to home high. This is uh, Haid Edge. Reynard's Clough actually is the place where I go for my walk, Nick, but I'll, I'll tell you about that later. Uh, and then uh, what we've got here is, is, is basically the Carboniferous Limestone, which is a potential but very complicated uh, geothermal source. It gets down to depths which would be of interest from a heat point of view. The problem is the lack of permeability and, and uh, defendable porosity. The millstone grit comes in there quite nicely and, and allows uh, this uh, a mix of shales and, and sandstones in a fairly uh, manageable area. And it shows also this collection of underlying granites in the far north of the Cheviot, the Weirdale granite, which uh, was a sort of a core of the Alston block, the Wensleydale granite. Then you come over this uh, uh, Craven Fault zone onto the edge of the uh, Asquig block, the, the Harrogate subbasin. Harrogate subbasin has got uh, also uh, the uh, hot springs uh, recycling the water. And we've just got the edge of the, 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 the coal measures, the tip of the coal measures, as, as, as we see this essentially this composite north south section. When you go down into the Derbyshire Dome, there you've got evidence of a very nice. Uh, hydrological system, plumbing system also, which had some volcanics in the Carboniferous era and also the mineralization there and also in, in places like uh, Greenhow, uh, which were basically recirculating above these Caledonian granites and probably uh, those ore deposits represent fossil uh, geothermal uh, systems. N these are, from a couple of BGS reports, they're not spectacular diagrams. The one thing I want to highlight here is that somewhere around one kilometer, you're already at about 40 degrees centigrade. 
So if you could find a way of connecting one kilometer with your underfloor heating in the bathroom or in the lounge, you'd have a very pleasant house. So that's, that's the sort of first thing. And if you go down to about three kilometers, you, you have sufficient more or less to run a turbine if you needed, but also in order to do lots of industrial processes and to run a district heating. The BGS have, have used this to develop some, some uh, in, initial uh, summaries of the, uh, of, the, of the geothermal story in 1986. And they've also produced some very nice uh, hydrogeological summaries uh, the Sherwood Sandstone. I worked with a guy called Phil Lovelock, who, when he worked for the BGS, uh, did a lot of uh, a lot of work on this. And Phil was a, a great geologist. The uh, the summary of seismic data that you can get just by having a look in this uh, uh, UK onshore geophysical library is fantastic. You can also manage to have a a, a sort of a, a summary of the data that. William Smith described uh, quite a few years before, but all this data is available. You have the area around Robin Hood's Bay where they're developing the Woodsmith Mine. And, and, and also as you, as you go th through this area, the, the, uh, the Zechstein Reservoirs, uh, the uh, uh, Sherwood Sandstone Reservoirs are, are, are available. This, this uh, shows the uh, area of the uh, section going from somewhere roughly around Whitby uh, with a big jog in this area around through uh, uh, Filey Bay and over down towards the south uh, past Bridlington. So thinking about the, the building bricks that uh, this geothermal needs to be uh, reservoired in, we have basically three big unconformities and essentially three potential reservoir hosts and, and, and one sort of maybe difficult one. The coal measures, the Permian, Zechstein and, and Le Mans sands and the Sherwood sands are classically uh, developed in the continent. They're also uh, relatively uh, reasonable to, to, to model and also they're, they're layered or confined aquifer systems. The chalks, whether it's in the Denantian limestone or the, or, or uh, sorry, the Denantian limestones, the so-called Carboniferous limestone or the mountain limestone and the chalks are more difficult because they tend to be unconfined. They have fracture systems which may dominate and give very high yields, but are very difficult in terms of, of, of managing uh, their performance. Also, if if you, you use them, they are somewhat prone to uh, developing uh, a seismic risk. To summarize the thermal events we've had in Yorkshire, uh, there are a few uh, lamprefire dikes, I think, somewhere near Ostwick, which are the only bits of older volcanic material that I could dig out. I seem to remember a field trip from a, a long time ago with Jack Artler lad. Uh, when I was an undergraduate in, in Leeds, and uh, that was in about 1971. Uh, there's also the, the, uh, the, the geophysical evidence of the Wensleydale granites, and, and also under the, the uh, Market Wheaton area, and then possibly in the offshore. So there was some heat in the area uh, around uh, until about the base tertiary, uh, and then basically you have a blanket. So with heat and, and geothermal, you have heat sources, but also on top of that, you can have insulators, which actually prevent the heat coming out. You've got a sort of a fairly steady boundary condition on the top, depending on how much mud and, and low conductivity stuff on top of that, that's what builds up your, your uh, thermal gradient. So, Having looked at essentially the building bricks for housing this geothermal system, I'd like to now talk about how to access it from as a, as a plumber would uh, try fitting in a circulation system in the house. And there are basically a, a, a number of uh, technologies, ground source heat pumps are well established, borehole thermal 
energy storage and, and borehole thermal systems are where you can have holes essentially drilled into concrete with a piece of black pipe. That's on the drawing from the BGS. Ground source heat pumps are can be fitted by trained plumbers and can be very widespread. They are easier to fit in alluvial settings, which don't require a lot of drilling either with a, a, a soil based system or in certain cir circumstances, an open system. I'll come on to that in a minute. The BGS have made great strides in the last couple of years in, in, in starting these geoenergy observatories. And I have to really congratulate them and people like uh, John Midgley and Mike Stevenson and uh, Alison Monaghan, who've really uh, brought this on. It's fantastic what they're doing. Uh, I hope that they will find ways to convert these observatories into commercial projects, because when you're actually faced with the market, then you, you're really forced to solve problems. And I hope the coal authority and the universities working on this uh, can, can develop this. Aquathermal energy storage, or ARTES, or uh, WKO in, in the Netherlands, is a very important thing, because if you have excess heat, you can stick it in a shallow aquifer and there's great scope for possibly uh, using these more widespread uh, in addition uh, to drill on purpose uh, hot uh, sedimentary aquifers say 60 or 80 centigrade that would be targeting things like the Sherwood sandstone or the Le Mans sandstone in, in some settings and we'll, we'll come on to where that is. But my absolute number one favorite is coal mines. Thinking about how are we gonna use the coal mines? All the tricks we learn in these geoenergy observatories to where they're actually sat under cities and social housing projects or the edge of York. And I think there's a great opportunity for us to start now trying to do studies in terms of what can we do where we are in, with a sort of a place-based approach Let's concentrate on making the most of what we've got, reusing and recycling all these facilities. So for instance, if you have a, a data center or somewhere that's shipping uh, computer bits or uh, you know computer refills somewhere on the M62, there may be the possibility there's a mine site underneath there, which would store all the building heat that is in excess because the building has to be cooled if that could be put underground and stored, it could be then used when we have a cold snap. So instead of uh, wasting that heat and letting it uh, just be radiated, we could probably build it into the uh, heating and cooling systems and people like uh, Simon Rees and, and uh, Fleur Rovledge in, in the University of Leeds look very much at this uh, connection between buildings and uh, heating and cooling. So aquathermal energy storage or reusing the mines or first of all, say like they did in, in the Netherlands, take mines, use them as a heat source and when they, they stop being very hot, then you can use it for, for heat storage. For those who are unfamiliar with uh, ground source heat pumps, I'm assured it's as simple as a fridge running backwards. Well, probably that sounds a bit flippant, but it involves uh, taking the heat out of uh, fluid, which has been pumped from the ground, uh, using that to connect and then to compress it, that creates it uh, to, to warm up. Then you pass it through an expansion valve, which, which cools it, and then the thing is reheated. David Banks uh, is a, a consultant and a, a widespread advocate of, of this and also uh, using it in either an open, an open source setting or with a, just a circulating pipe. The BGS a while ago came up with a bunch of tools which have allowed uh, basically to go screening the area. And this is essentially a transform of the geological map turned into a drillability and uh, you know, uh, hydraulic uh, properties map. And it, it sort of shows where this nice green, bright green stripe is. This is where you've got good aquifer, but it's a bit concealed or this, this sort of uh, different 
yellowy colors, you, you have reasonable aquifers. One thing that you have to say though, is that if you've got hard rock, then you know, you're, it's not looking good in Wales or the Lake District, but there, there are plenty of areas uh, in Yorkshire where this uh, ap appears to be feasible. The, the UK geoenergy uh, observatories, and, and this is a slide from, uh, from John Midgley's talk at the Northern Powerhouse meeting, which was a, a very great uh, uh, session. And it shows the, the principle of actually taking warm water from, uh, uh, fr from the system, uh, you, you, you put it through a, a heat pump, that heat pump also puts it through a heat exchanger and then you can have a nice warm bathroom or uh, you know living room. What it what it doesn't talk about here is the complexity of rather than being a plumber needing to be something like like a heart surgeon or or a, you know, a vascular surgeon connecting the right cavities and avoiding the wrong holes, because to drill and to and to run the plumbing inside these mines is a very complicated business. Dave Creedy, who was in the same cohort as me in, uh, in Leeds in, and graduated in 74, has also done some stuff on coal bed methane, which is a, an area I looked down before. But, but also this, this map is a very nice summary as to, as to what the status of, of reflooding of the, the mines after they've been abandoned. And you've got this nice big square up in this, this area here, uh, to the east of Leeds in the Selby area. There's some really hot stuff here, and I'll, I'll come on to that in a minute. There are a number of ways that uh, you can uh, extract the heat uh, from the mines. This appears to be shoot using a shaft. In some cases, uh, shafts will not be uh, accessible, so you, you would have to create large diameter uh, wells. Uh, there's, there's basically uh, four different systems. This system here is, is roughly what the mining museum uh, have. Here's a photo from a, a publication by Dave Banks showing the uh, aeration ponds and, and the, uh, the, the heat house. And here's a cross section showing the layout of the, the galleries uh, underneath the Hope shaft. And, and here's that. A few years ago, I went underground I think during the Yorkshire uh, Geology Day, led by uh, the president, uh, the previous president, John Knight, and uh, I, I've uh, also taken a student or two from Leeds uh, to this area. What this shows is that uh, there is a huge voidage underground. You have to think about how to navigate in there, but it's a great source of heat. This shows the uh, area of galleries mined out in the Beeston seam. And this is giving you some idea of the plumbing going from Lepton Edge, where I used to go every day going to school, going past there, going to school in Wakefield, past uh, the Hope Shaft and, and into Wakefield. This also shows the, the, the range of, uh, uh, there's a, a, a small hydraulic gradient and, and What's more important, it shows the sort of flow rates possible, uh, you know, from Woolley, 120 liters a second of 16 degrees C water. You know, that's got a potential of, of three and a half megawatts. That doesn't sound bad to me. You could, you could heat quite a few buildings or, or areas of that. Currently the Hope Shaft is, is uh, capable of just under a megawatt. And if they shut it in, the temperature goes up significantly from 13 up to 20 or something like that. During the lockdown uh, at Leeds, working with uh, uh, Sandra Piazzolo, uh, Eric uh, Peterson, Imogen Rattle and, and Jamie Van Olsteen, we had a, a team working on application of geoscience uh, to the energy transition. And one of the uh, one of the products here was to show the juxtaposition of uh, mine shafts here colored in these nice uh, gallery layouts under the junction 45 in the in the Leeds area. This this was Eric's favorite spot. It's called a 
Junction 45 project and with mine shafts to access it, but it's also a highly populated area. It's an area which has got uh, social housing. It's an area with industrial facilities. So isn't this a possible area where we could actually combine excess heat with underground storage and in some cases possibly utilizing the mine water sticking that through a heat pump and actually doing a bit of a better job in terms of reusing and, and repurposing these legacy assets. The, the idea of that is, is sort of explained here in a policy document that uh, Leeds University have uh, that uh, th this team put out and it, it, it looks at basically if you've got storage space and and uh, too much uh, too much heat supply then you can stick it underground and, and, and use it for later this this uh, graph here shows the uh, on, on the y-axis uh, basically a, a heat demand which is greater than heat supply and then in the summer months you may have an oversupply of heat which you could store and then uh, later on if you stick that underground when this heat supply is insufficient you could provide it to buildings uh, at the, in, the, in the spring or the autumn to, uh, to bump up the, uh, the, the heating. So utilizing the void space to uh, put warm water in there, keep it there and then reuse it when you want it is, is a possibility. The company I work with in Holland, If Technology, have this as, as one of their, you know, their core values about having an integrated view right the way from reusing the water temperature, aquathermal, geothermal, and then heat storage in shallow storage and then deep, deep geothermal. And uh, they're, they're working out of uh, Arnhem. Now it's not all Spain sailing. Uh, the, the, the way people used to mine uh, coal seams was in little bell pits. And these, these this uh, collection of little circles and, and pills is, from a, a BGS summary of, of the Middleton main seams, one of the main seams uh, around the, the area of the Beeston seam. And it shows the complexity of void space uh, as you go from an, out, uh, an open cast area, there's the area that was mined out with these bell pits, and then you get into the pillar and store area. Billy Andrews, a guy who's, I think, doing his thesis or done his thesis in uh, Strathclyde has made a very nice diagram looking at the different types of challenges associated with uh, with developing uh, and, and, and managing these these uh, legacy uh, coal assets. So it's 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 not a piece of cake. It's more like a sort of a heart surgery or brain surgery than a pure plumber. But it really is worth it because it's a huge voidage. Uh, structural geologists like myself. And, and, and engineering geologists and leads have the tools in order to work on this. And it's really worth thinking about it as a different type of reservoir that we can uh, work out how to switch it on and off. What the, what the Coal Authority have recently done is, is publish some very lovely maps in the Quarterly Journal of Engineering Geology. And you have these uh, different coal areas. You can see the, the, the Durham, Newcastle coalfield, the Nottinghamshire and, uh, and Yorkshire coalfield. And this is a sort of a depth slice of 400 meters. And then Bob's your uncle over by York, you've got, what is it, 40, 45, 45 degrees, bingo. You know, you could almost put a tea bag in that. So let's think about uh, what can we do in terms of utilizing this? What's, what's the best way? So I just think there's a great uh, resource available and, and these, these publicly open access uh, articles are very good and combined with the work that the BGS is doing on these, these mining projects up here. There's also incidentally uh, a, a mine water project being cooked up uh, down in South Wales, which is also extremely interesting. I've lost my mouse, sorry. Here we go. So that is to say that if you've got temperature, you can have power. So if we take, say, this, this vertical line here is around 40 degrees. If you've got 40 degrees, you can bump it up to something quite useful, 
uh, and and if you don't have the temperature like they have in the Hague or in Trias Westland in in the Netherlands or like they had by the way in uh, in Southampton you you can bridge that gap with uh, with the heat pump equally uh Heerlein is a, a long a long developed uh, mine water project in in the Netherlands down in uh, southern Limburg on the way to Aachen and there's a bunch of other uh, possible things John Gluas in the Energy Institute in uh, in Durham and some also some people in in Newcastle and Glasgow have been doing some good work on this so there's basically you know this 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 tells us that you know above about 40 you could start to get into the megawatts so you could start start to actually make some some reasonable projects uh, Stuart Watson, Sean Watson, and and uh, Rob Westerway and, and 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 others at Glasgow have been compiling some uh, some material where they took uh, essentially the the uh, permatriasic play concept of uh, of the BGS and and put it into a compilation map and highlighted also where there were oil fields as well as specific uh, geothermal wells. These were the geothermal wells drilled in the in the 80s uh, but there are also lots of uh, geothermal resource information residing in uh, oil and gas wells what's of particular interest to me is is actually what's below Rydale because you don't necessarily need to frack it because actually apparently half the problem with the wells there was they, they water out too quickly so you have fractured uh, existing reservoirs which don't perform well from a hydrocarbons point of view, because too much hot, too much hot water comes out. So isn't that an opportunity? So let's try and bring the geologists, i.e. the builders with the plumbers, and let's get them talking and, and making maps. In, uh, in an oil company, uh, this would be called play-based exploration, where you look at a play, you look at uh, combining from the, the basin level, the regional geology, you recognize, according to the stratigraphy, a number of plays, and then you develop that into a prospect inventory, a prospect evaluation. Essentially, for hydrocarbons, you have to look at source, maturity, reservoir, seal, migration and trapping. The same is true looking at, at geothermal. If you remember in the first technical slide I showed was basically the heat is a, a function of the the rate of flow, the density, specific heat, and the change in temperature. This is a fundamental, fundamental question. If you don't have enough temperature, you can talk to a heat pump. You can't change the density of water or the specific heat, but you can big, drill big diameter wells, which is what geothermal does, to actually do that. Tessa Jordan, who's an academic in, uh, in the US in Cornell, has, has turned this into a little bit of a workflow. The Dutch also have similar workflows, uh, which are very nice in, in a project called the Thermogis. What I've done here is I try to combine, as you would in an energy company, a variety of plays that we've been uh, coming across. So underlying this is, is uh, Stuart Watson's very nice map, these nice shades of, of purple, which which show essentially the BGS 10 Darcy meter play. Sorry about the exclamation mark, that should be 10 Darcy meter. That's a sort of a cutoff transmissivity and, and temperature thing that in the 1986 uh, play summation they did. There's also the calibration with some of the oil and gas wells, which are better understood. And essentially that, that follows the coast down from somewhere around Robert Hood's Bay down to somewhere on the, on the Lincoln coast, where this this is nice uh, sort of purple belt. To the west of that, uh, highlighted by the 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 uh, red uh, box around the North Selby mine complex, just south of York, you have basically a a mine complex in the upper part of the uh, the coal measures, where you've got 40 45 degree warm water. Question is. What are we going to do with that? What does that tell us about an opportunity? How do we combine that? On top of it, we have the, the, the Sherwood 
uh, sandstone aquifer, and below it we have the Zechstein. Uh, the Zechstein in outcrop is seen to be quite a complicated carbonate system, but it, it may be possible. My question is, how are we going to use the, the, the exposed and shallowly buried uh, coal field, which I, I've sort of called here the, the uh, heat or store play of the Barnsley, Silkston or Beeston seams or the Middleton seams, because there's a great opportunity basically from, you know, somewhere between Sheffield, Barnsley, Wakefield and Leeds, where you've got this, this whole area which has, has been reflooded. So you, you have basically flooded mine galleries and the possibility of a void space in order to store heat and to develop other projects uh, beyond things like the uh, mining museum. Uh, we, we know there's a possibility and I don't know, maybe there's something already happening at the, uh, at the Woolly area, uh, but you know, I, I just like to highlight this because for the energy transition, this seems like a, a pretty good area. The other area I, I'd like to highlight is, is possibly a bit of a red hot potato, the, the Rydale area, where people have had concerns about the existing uh, developments. There may be a hot water play there, which is just sitting there uh, in, in the facilities that don't work very well as oil and gas wells. So rather than getting all steamed up about fracking, there may be existing facilities which could be reused. We, we know Kaythorpe, for instance, was going to be used or could be used as a storage place. That was also quite a, a warmish place, Forden. So there's a number of areas where combined with say greenhouse or some sort of horticulture like the Dutch do, that would be quite a nice uh, collection, Vale of York, uh, Vale of Pickering, uh, that's an opportunity. Now, the other one is this alluvial and glacial deposits. The reason for that is that basically, if you want to if you want to do heat pumps, doing it where it requires hard rock drilling is expensive and uh, not, not easy. Uh, whereas if you if you have alluvial gravels where you can actually in, pump instead of drill to actually put your uh, heat exchanger in, that seems like a much easier play. Essentially, that would that would be in the floodplains around the air wharf and ooze and that would be a play which i'm pretty sure people like uh the civ Eng department in leeds and i know eric in uh, uh eric peterson has has got this all stitched up david banks i'm sure is is fully aware of of the extent of of this so where you have basically easily drillable stuff you could have the heat pump system a little bit deeper things where you could either make heat from the mines or store heat in the mines. And then a little bit deeper than that, the, 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 the Triassic Sherwood sandstones. Basically, as, as, you, as you go stratigraphically up the sequence uh, towards the East Coast, there's a whole range of, uh, of, of possibilities there. This is just a reminder that basically, uh, Oh, yeah, this is from IF, my, the company I sometimes do some work with, uh, how they see and operate uh, where you actually produce in a syncline, inject into the shallow bit, you put it through a, a heat exchanger, that heat exchanger, if necessary, takes out uh, or can be peak fed with, with gas to make backup or to reuse gas that comes out of solution. And then you can you can warm up your shower or your underfloor heating, return it back into the injector well. You can't produce. Uh, you, you you must re-inject the same as as you produce. If you just produce hot water and let it spill, your resource will die. And not only that, uh, it's very uh, environmentally unfriendly. If you re-inject it. A sufficient distance away from the production well you will maintain the pressure and also in time that will allow it to become uh, reheated. So I'm, I'm just about there. This is just a quick photo uh, showing that the footprint of this, if anyone knows uh, the tram route number six uh, going towards uh, uh, 
the, uh, the, the coast at uh, Kike Down. This is the number six tram terminus. This is the Hagsa Ardwamt Leiwech uh, facility. This is what the thing looks like. It's a rather sort of brutalistic uh, thing, but uh, interesting uh, powerhouse. Here's a picture of a, a, dr a drill rig in the uh, Trias Westland site. Uh, for those who enjoy uh, Saturday night uh, crime series Spiral, this is the uh, geothermal setup in the heart of Paris. And again, this is showing that geothermal can absolutely fit in with the built environment. Here's this beautiful town hall. Here's the heat plant. There you are, here's the heat plant. So think about that. So the last couple of slides, there's favorable uh, data of, uh, and geology uh, in Yorkshire that allows us to build in the Northern Powerhouse on experience from the Netherlands. The trick of the Netherlands was not to be focused just on the resource, but to build on uh, market driven things, greenhouses and, and social housing as a staircase to develop this, to get experience. Those, those uh, projects have a cooperative, uh, you know, a society of geothermal folk working in the area. I've been in contact with people in the Southwest and there's a Southwest Geothermal Alliance. I know John Germatis, Germanis is involved in that. And maybe that's something that we need to consider up in Yorkshire and, and the North, that we have some sort of uh, geothermal alliance or geothermal cooperative where mine water and deep, uh, deep reuse of facilities or reusing uh, oil and gas wells work together rather than being in the heat pump mine water in separate silos. I'd just like to bring everyone together a little bit and, and find a way to, to, to work on that. Keep pushing for a proper definition of who owns the heat. The BGS are on the case, but we need to get proper support from bays from the government in order to have a proper uh, risk insurance. The Netherlands and Switzerland, where I've done some work, have risk mitigation schemes. And also the YGS, I think, can have a uh, continuing role, organizing great meetings like the one at York Museum, uh, just when the, there was some rugby playing. I uh, had a nice beer with uh, Rob Knight then and uh, the Northern Powerhouse. Let's have more meetings like that. Uh, the, the YGS has produced some fantastic books. Uh, one of the first books I bought was edited by Dorothy Rayner and was uh, uh, the, the Geology and Mineral Resources, which is absolutely one of my favorite uh, afternoon or bedtime reading. So let's see how the YGS can actually engage in this uh, uh, Energy Transition Leeds University has a group called the Geosolutions Group. Uh, Rachel Spraggs and, and uh, Sandra Piazzolo and, and others are involved in this and, and they're there to, to help that. I'm sure other universities, Sheffield, Leeds, uh, Hull, Durham, Newcastle, all can contribute to this, but it's, it's something where we should try to join together rather than being in little silos. So one of the things that Leeds has, has done is try to think about how can we uh, think of the complementary use of this. This is a, a summary of some of the ideas that we're, we're trying to put this together uh, with, with Andy Amory and J Jamie Van Oersteen and Eric and Sandra and uh, Imogen Yeva. We're actually putting all these things together where you actually think about how to reuse the, uh, the mine water, reuse these, these small uh, borehole storage things. There's a few other more complicated setups with different blue and green hydrogen. I just prefer to stick to, to heat from the, the earth. So uh, one more thing. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the support. Mike Bowman twisted my arm. I felt guilty not doing it because Paul Hildreth has, has uh, made a fantastic job, especially his, his videos and support for the Huddersfield uh, geological uh, group and also lots of people at Leeds University. 
I'd just like to acknowledge my teachers as well, Dorothy Rayner, Mike Leader, Mike Coward, Ernie Rutter and Rick Sibson, who's been a great uh, influence on, on me. And last but not least, Paul Younger, who was a really inspirational uh, speaker and author. And uh, when I came back to live in England, I, I started to read a lot of, by him and also to hear some of his uh, presentations, particularly at the Northumberland uh, Natural History Society. So, uh, yes. So thanks very much. And I think I've got one more slide. This is it. Just we're not Iceland, but we've got William Smith's map. The BGS are there to help. So are Leeds. And it fits into the, uh, the built environment. And I think we've got one more. The Yorkshire Geological Society have got lots of fantastic books. This uh, Geological Aspects and Development Planning was the first book I bought as an undergraduate in 1970. And I've still got it. And here's Dorothy Rayner's book and Mike Leader's new book. So uh, I'm out of time. Uh, so that's what I'd like to say. And obviously, uh, my email is, is in the, the system. Leeds and uh, all the universities, I'm sure, can can answer questions on this. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much. Um, questions. I think there are there are some questions that have popped up. Um, Rick, is it possible to to um, should I just read them out, or do you want to get me to get people to answer them themselves? Um, I'm happy. I think I think it's uh, if people want to ask them themselves, that's uh, I think what we've done in the past. So okay, so let's have a look then. Uh, I think the first question. Well, let me see now. Um, then here we go. Here we go. I'm getting it. I'm getting there now. Um, There's, a, there's a, a point of, of uh, information from someone. Um, let me see now. Um, sorry, I'm having to screen down for the thing. Um, John Mitchley. Yeah. Well, there's one from Paul Thornton. Um, so, well, shall I read them out? I think that might be easier. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry about the messing about. Paul Thornton asks, if you were to promote a pilot site to the government, is there a number one site in Yorkshire that could provide the, mo the most cost benefit? Uh, short answer is I, uh, I, could, I can think of a few, but I, I wouldn't, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't be able to say what that is that we're looking at a number of places to uh, to, to sort of uh, do some pre-feasibility work. Uh, I think uh, combining the some areas around Leeds where there is social housing, there are uh, mine areas, the, the complexity there is it's relatively shallow and those are relatively old mines. So the condition of uh, the cavity system may not be good. Uh, but uh, the short answer is, Paul, I don't know because I've not done sufficient work, but uh, that, that is uh, in process. Okay, uh, next one is um, John Midgley, who asks, Nick, um, third energy, well, it's a piece of information actually, third energy is looking at converting its ex-fracking well stock in Rydale into geothermal producers. So that was a piece of information you mentioned about Rydale and so on. Well, that was, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd been looking at that and that just struck me rather than annoying people. Uh, why, why not try to use, you know, what's yeah. what's in our backyard? And I'm very pleased to hear that Third Energy are going to do to do the needful. Excellent. Good news. Yeah, good. OK, next question is from Paul Howlett. A very interesting talk, Nick. Thank you. But he asks, uh, perhaps we could take a lesson from the radioactive waste geological disposal facility project, prepare a resource map and make the science very visible such that local communities and organizations can step forwards as hosts. 
Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. That's why I've tried to uh, make this what I call a play map, but I think that's a bit frivolous. Uh, but I think having a play map, which leads, I'm uh, going to do some more on that, and then put on that the mixture of the, su the subsurface and also the uh, uh, possible market areas, greenhouses or social housing or whatever. And then, you know, explain to different uh, groups, whether they're local economic partnerships, whether they're local councils, what the possibilities are. And then uh, that would be a way of fun funneling uh, government money. But I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just an old guy and uh, I'm happily working uh, with Leeds and I, I want to do that some more. But in terms of how to do that, I couldn't agree more. The, the way that the uh, waste group and Mike is uh, quietly smiling in the corner, uh, you know, I think that's a great model uh, to, to also, you know, ask what the interest is rather than telling them what's going to happen. I think the best way to do that, though, is to have a good scientific basis. And this is something that I hope the Geosolutions Group at Leeds can cooperate with other people to, to have a proper foundation to you know, keep it down to earth. Okay, thank you. Uh, next one's from Aidan Foley. He, he says, you spoke about permeability in the deep carboniferous limestones being an issue. How much, sorry, it's just jumped. Uh, how much information do we actually have about these deep systems in Yorkshire? And it's possibly directed to Nick Riley as well, this one, the, the president. So how much information do we have about these deep systems in Yorkshire? Well, the shallow systems, I, I personally gone caving in them. And that was one of the main reasons why I went to, uh, to Leeds University in 1970. The deep systems in terms of uh, uh, how, how they work, uh, there is evidence uh, from the mineralization from, from places like Providence and Springfield level uh, in underneath Greenhow, that there is permeability and that there was open permeability at depth. Uh, the work we've done in the Netherlands, looking at uh, the colon calc or the denantian carbonates that uh, the EBN and, and Shell and the Port of Rotterdam and others are looking at, TNO, they, they've been looking at the information from the petroleum industries and various penetrations there. And they find that there is some permeability in very uh, narrow bits. And also managing that is extremely difficult in terms of the susceptibility to inducing earthquakes. The, the permeability of these things is often in a critically stressed state. So if you change the pore pressure, either by producing or injecting, you've got to be very careful you don't start uh, switching on earthquakes so it 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 could be engineered and these are more in the engineered geothermal systems rather than the deep sedimentary ones where you have fracture and karstic porosity preserved they tend to be in in structurally defined zones in fault zones in uh, sort of hinges you know like the buried extent of the north craven and mid craven fault system I would go looking there. The only problem is that if I drilled holes there, I'd probably probably create earthquakes. So, you know, um, they're not easy systems. They're not uh, systems to simply engineer in, in the same way as confined, layered, sedimentary sandstone ones. I love limestones, but they're much more difficult to manage. Yeah, okay. I just drop in with that one. Yeah. Um, there are natural <coughs> hydrothermal systems working today in southwest England. Uh, there's famous hot Baths. wells in Bristol, yeah. and of course the Roman Baths at Bath. Yeah. And although that is coming up through the Jurassic, it's actually the Carboniferous limestone beneath the base Jurassic yeah. and conformity, which is feeding the, the warm springs there. I don't know what the temperature at Buxton is. I'm not sure. Buxton, but, it's it's not. I mean, the, the, there's Buxton, Matlock, Harrogate uh, as well. There's there's a number of them. Harrogate yeah. is is I, I understand recycling very 
fairly shallow stuff and it's it, it's not often in the in the carb limestone yeah. there's also you know stuff in the in the permian nesborough and boston mm. spa and so on so looking uh, and using those springs on a play map you know at the surface expression is absolutely the right thing to do looking at the isotopic composition and and possibly some of the the um, uh, geochemistry of the waters may give you a bit of a trace back as to what the maximum temperature has been. Carbonate uh, carbonate springs tend to be rather cooler than than mm. than in, in in volcanic settings. Unfortunately, yeah. we don't have any volcanic settings <laughs> on the coast at Selwick's Bay. I think there was a, a lecture around Christmas where they were talking about what is essentially a fossilized hydrothermal system at Selwyx Bay and a couple of other fault zones. Was it Jack, it was a guy called Jack Little, Paul? One of the, the, the bloke um, who gave us- no, Jack Lee. Jack Lee. Jack Lee, okay, yeah. But I mean, that was a very interesting thing. I think the, that group from Durham have done some nice uh, uranium lead dating on the, on the calcites. So that's telling us how the plumbing was then. Yeah. Uh, but again, the chalk, although can be highly permeable, is a bit difficult to manage from a, uh, it's, it's not confined. So you have these nice winter borns and winter springs, but also uh, quite difficult to, to manage. Okay, now then we have a run of six questions from Holger Kessler. I'll, I'll take them one at a time, Nick, if you're happy to take them. Yeah. First one, what is the single intervention the government could or should do to speed up the development of geothermal energy use? So, uh, so the single intervention would be to match a thorough definition of who owns the heat with uh, a risk insurance policy. So if, if, I, if I put my uh, European hat on, which I'm afraid, although a Yorkshireman, I'm, I'm very happy to do, the, the Dutch and also the Swiss have at least a defined mining law, defined law in, uh, which, although not perfect, allows uh, the development of subsurface water for heat. And there's also uh, environmental uh, risk risk insurance benefits based on the modeling if you're less than the p90 rate of a well you you can get some money from the government from the sde uh, environmental funding from the uh, the dutch research and environmental organization it's a sub branch of the economic affairs uh, and climate change of the dutch government they will pay for you to fix that drill a well you know, work it over, do something like that. In Switzerland, they have two types of uh, risk premiums. They have something that if your project replaces a CO2 emission thing, you, you, you get the equivalent value in terms of a CO2 tax. So they have a number of projects in Geneva and I think in the canton of Argau uh, near Zurich, where they're, they, they're saying if this, if this is going to avoid you know, burning hydrocarbons or creating heat from hydrocarbons and therefore cutting CO2, you get money that way. There are also some other incentives uh, to do with, uh, I think, renewable heat incentives. The, the effort the government has made recently on uh, supporting heat have been entirely to do with, uh, you know, electric things and I'm afraid don't help at all. I think there needs to be a major shakeup in terms of, and I'm sorry about this, Holger. I'm very pleased to, for the question, by the way, I've seen you very active on LinkedIn. So I'm, I, I will, you know, it's great. But I think there's plenty that could be done to actually get the subsurface on the agenda, uh, you know, constructive use of the subsurface. So great, happy for the question. Proper law, proper support. And then of course, the universities need to uh, provide some some 
training to people in order to have a cadre of engineers and geologists who can work in the BGS, who can work for Atkins, Arup, etc., uh, to help develop these things because the in energy transition is going to need people, you know, you know, rather than workshops. They're going to need people who are skilled in normal subsurface technologies that the oil industry used to do. You still need to do it, you know, for these types of things. Drilling, completion, uh, you know, fitting pipe work. That's it's the same work. Okay. Right, the next one from Holger is, have we got a register of successful UK schemes, including cost benefit analysis? I can see Mike shaking his head. Uh, I think I, uh, we could. Uh, there's a lot of tacit knowledge in a number of people's heads. I hope some of them are on this call. But, uh, you know, in terms of working together, that's not been the strong point of the geothermal community. If you look historically as to how it's gone, there was a number of schemes in the 70s which were related to the first or second oil shock and they were going to produce electricity. There's not been that much development in terms of looking at heat. I think the, the likes of people like Paul Younger and David Manning and, and John Gluyas and, and, and some others, David Banks at the, the Shallow Stuff, they, they've been doing these things. But for instance, the International Geothermal Association doesn't have a British branch. You know, UK is not in a lot of projects that are in Europe. There may be other reasons politically for that now because there is no single UK geothermal thing. There is sort of a branch in the Geological Society developing, sort of, and Charlotte Adams, who may be on the call, so I'd better be careful. She, she's, uh, you know, championed this on and off. Uh, she's now in the, the Coal Authority. We need something which brings, you know, all these hot water guys together and girls and, and people thinking about heat and also not only generating heat but storing heat because I think uh, the reuse of geological assets is as important as creating heat. I think the two go hand in hand. So we'd like to do that Holger and please send me an email. And finally, uh, got, I said six originally but some of them are duplicates. Um, final question, again from Holger. In your opinion, which regulator or regulators should be responsible for geothermal energy? <laughs> How long have you got? <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I, again, I'm, I'm just a, somebody who used to work in industry and then I, I'm, I'm helping out a little bit to university now. What I do see is that the BGS is a very a very nice science-based area and, and lots of innovations. What I don't see at the moment is I don't see a national operator for the subsurface in the same way as say the nuclear uh, people have. And I'm just wondering if, if this is wise. In the Netherlands, there is a, you know, there's energy be here in Nederland. There's the geological survey, which is TNO. And there's, you know, the government sort of uh, the government shareholder, which is now becoming an operator. So I, I think there is a role possibly for maybe the geoenergy division of of BGS to have some people who are in a more operational role. The point is that you need uh, like an operating company as well as a compliance unit. And. Uh, the compliance unit in the Netherlands is this uh, SODM, which is the sort of Staatsoversicht de Mijn, the, the, the mine supervisory board. You need something like that. Maybe the coal authority is, is for that. But, you know, you, you need to have a group which is uh, dealing with the compliance and the safety and, and possibly the, the integrated energy planning 
and you need somebody who's actually an operator. And at the moment, what happens is somebody has a go, uh, it might work a little bit and then it fails. And then, you know, that person goes and, and, and gets another job or gets cheesed off. So instead of there being institutionalized learning or what in the industry is called play-based learning, where you actually reduce the cost of projects, you, you, every time you do a project, you work out what went wrong, what went well. You fix the design, repeat it, improve it, repeat it, improve it. So each time your, your execution costs go down and your understanding of the play goes up. Unless you actually have replication and enforced learning, you know, if, if every man and his dog does his own little project and doesn't share that data, it's never going to work. So my feeling is some sort of uh, regulatory thing is, is important for making sure it's safe and, you know, coordinated. Now, whether it's the Coal Authority, the Environment Agency, I don't know the politics of the place, but I know you need people who can do things. You know, storing CO2 or doing these projects costs money. You know, and you need to drill wells, you need to manage the subsurface. So you need to convert. I mean, what they're doing in the Netherlands, Shell are employing lots of people from the Shell Dutch company, the Netherlands Ardoil Mask Bay, to actually work on projects there. They've got the experience, they know how to drill, they know the subsurface, and they're now starting to develop projects in the port of Rotterdam and, 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 and places like that. So I think you need companies like nuclear, nuclear people, but maybe ex-oil company people, uh, and people who are not just gray hair. You need people with, uh, you know, vim and vigor, Maybe we can convert a few engineering geology folk and turn them into a national operator. But I, I think you need that as well as uh, folk dealing with the uh, compliance and, and safety side, because you can't have them all sitting in the same house as the scientists, which are the BGS doing great stuff. But they, you know, they can't be the, the operator, the regulator, and that's not their role, or at least that doesn't seem to be their role. I, I don't know who's on the call, so I've got to be careful here. But I, I'm sure I'm, <laughs> I'm sort of talking out of, uh, out of line. Nick, help me out. <laughs> okay. Uh, BGS isn't a regulator. Um, it's, a, it's a National Geological Survey. It houses data about the subsurface of the US, and it also houses expertise. But it's, you know, it's more on a research or getting from research into demonstration uh, exactly. level. Yeah, not deployment on a commercial scale. Exactly. So it's like the TNO and it, it's like Swiss Topo and in, 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 in a bunch of other things. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well done, Nick. Getting through all those. Uh, I'll hand over to Mike Bowman, I think it is, who's going to take over. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, and thanks so much, Nick, for a, a super well-balanced, well-illustrated uh, talk on uh, a piece of the UK's energy portfolio, as you're saying, it's got, it has potential, but it hasn't got any legs at the moment. And, uh, and it's how we, we can use this to gain some momentum in here. But it was, it was a super talk, everything from advice on drying garlic, reflections on Jack Hartley. I remember Jack taking us to those outcrops as well. Um, and, uh, but and also aligning us to surgeons rather than plumbers, I think, is a much better way of thinking about it. The value and importance of things like the integrated subsurface description and the tools and techniques that we have applied for oil and gas. But this is a timely talk. It was. I think you're frozen, Mike. Mike, if you keep still, you use less bandwidth. <laughs> Are you just on microphone, Mike? 
I think he might have dropped out entirely. Dick. Dropped out. What a shame. Well, I'll, I'll follow through with with Mike's comments. It was yeah. a brilliant talk, Nick. Thank you very much. And it is a neglected area. There's no doubt about it. And it needs a critical mass, more joined up thinking. I remember talking to shale gas companies and to people who were against shale gas, trying to tell them, don't you see this is a way to get an infrastructure in for a transition from gas through to geothermal energy, also upgrading biogas. And you, uh, especially in the filed area, which when I was a boy, was a big market gardening area full of greenhouses, you know, in the low entropy heat to heat those. Yeah. yeah, and the gas to heat them and everything else, you know. But I just wish people weren't in their silos. I wish people would think, we're trying to solve the problem. We have to get this energy transition in place as quickly as possible. Let's work together and not stick in our purest silos, you know. Um, yeah. Much better to work together, in my, I think. Can so it's great news at Rydale. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Right. So just, so thanks again, Nick. Sorry about that. My, my system went completely off. Um, just a couple of bits of uh, promotion. Uh, we are planning to have a YGS meeting in first quarter next year at Hull University hosted by Graham Ferry. I know Nick's going to probably get involved in that. So that will be on geothermal energy. So we're, we're going to build on this momentum. Um, our next webinar is on the 25th of March with Chris Greenwell, who's going to be talking about uh, environmental geology, uh, the lead mining and pollution remediation uh, in metal mines. Uh, so that's Chris Greenwell from Durham. Um, and and that this webinar will be on YouTube for the next two weeks. So if you want to look at it again and, and get some of the great gems from Nick, please feel free to do so. And thank you all for joining us. We had over 80 at the top part of it, so well done. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. You're welcome, Paul. Take care, all. You were going to tell me about Reynard Clough. <laughs> yeah.